I found a story about a man named Toshiyuki. So this story comes from the document known as the Uji Shui Monogatari, which was a tale of a tale of Japanese tales, which was a collection of Japanese tales, written around the 13th century. But we don't know who the author is, sadly. Um, but the meaning of the title Uji Shui Monogatari means like gleanings from the Uji Dainagon Monogatari. So these are, you know, tales from another book. But sadly, that book no longer exists. So unfortunately, fortunately, we do still have this copy. And that original book that these tales were come from um was from around the time so it's the Uji Dainagon and the Dainagon at the time from the area of Uji was Minamoto no Takakuni and he lived from 1004 to 1077 to give an idea of when that original book probably existed I have I have a, a quick review question Dainagon what is that again Dinagon was a title that came into use in 702 and was bestowed to government councillors. Prior to this, the post had a different name of Oi Monomosu Tsukasa. So yes, their their title in itself was like a government councillor. Uh, so this story relates, well in the book, he's known as Toshiyuki and the notes I have in the book I'm reading today it says that Toshiyuki was Fujiwara no Toshiyuki. So a little bit about his life. Um, he was a poet and a celebrated calligrapher who died around 901 and he served under four different emperors during his time. In 897 he became captain of the Imperial Guard of the Right and in total we can find 29 different poems of his in various pre in various imperial anthologies as well as in his private collection and he was actually part of Fujiwara no Kinto's 36 poetry immortals so the 36 poets he thought were the best at the time and again not planned he's in the Okura Hyakuin issue so I have his poem as well that I can read at the end of this episode excellent I'm also stealing Heather's corner today Yay. and testing your translation of Japanese. Oh no! <laughs> okay, so Toshiyuki, a respected poet and calligrapher, had such beautiful handwriting that people were always asking him to copy the Lotus Sutra for them. They took it for granted that Toshiyuki's elegant rendition of the sacred text would help them towards a better life. Toshiyuki had copied the Sutra 200 times this way, when he suddenly died. Not realising what had happened though, he only knew that he had been abruptly seized and dragged off. He was outraged and could not understand how anyone, even the emperor, could do such a thing to a man of his standing. What have I done to deserve this? he asked the officer, who he thought had arrested him. Who knows? the officer replied. I was ordered to go and get you, and that's what I'm doing. Come to think of it, have you been making copies of the Lotus Sutra? Toshiyuki said that he had. How much of this copying was for yourself? None of it. It's all been for other people. I must have done a couple of hundred in total. That's it then. There have been complaints about them, and I suppose that that's the reason that you're here. That was all Toshiyuki could get out of this man, and they marched on in silence. Soon they met a force of 200 warriors, wearing grim battle armour and riding strange, terrible horses. Their eyes and their ghastly faces flashed like lightning and their mouths were like fire. Toshiyuki almost fainted with fear, but the officer forced him back to his feet and they went on with the soldiers before them. Who are they? Toshiyuki managed to stammer. Don't you know? They're the people who had you write out the sutra for them. They were counting on the merit, getting them reborn in heaven, or at least giving them another try as a human. But you, you were eating fish and enjoying women all the time you did your copying. You never purified yourself. On the contrary, 
you had your mind on nothing but the ladies. So they had no merit whatsoever from your work, and were born instead into these fierce, warlike forms. They're so angry that they want revenge, and that's why they've been demanding that you be called in. To tell the truth, it wasn't actually your time to die yet, but they insisted. Toshiyuki felt as though a knife had gone through him, and his heart froze. What are they going to do to me, he asked. Obviously, they're going to cut you up with those swords and daggers of theirs into two hundred little pieces, and each of them is going to keep one. Every piece will be you, fully conscious, so you'll suffer horribly any time any one of them tortures the pieces he got. Oh yes, you'll find it worse than anything you can imagine. What can I do to be spared? I've no idea, the officer replied. I can't see what would save you. Toshiyuki was nearly out of his mind with terror. Only they went till they came to a great river, running as black as the blackest of inks. Toshiyuki asked what these strange inky waters might be. Don't you understand, the officer answered. This is the ink from all the Lotus Sutra copies that you have made. A sutra copied with pure heart is accepted instantly into the palace of the Dragon King, who guards the Buddha's teachings. But copies made like yours, with defiled mind and filthy body, are thrown away into the fields, and the ink washes off in the rain till it makes a river. Oh please, sobbed Toshiyuki, is there no help for me, nothing I can do? I'm sorry, I might possibly be able to do something for you if your sins were a commonplace one but I'm afraid what you've done is unspeakable. You'll get no reprieve. Just when a frightened fiend charged up, growled at the officer that he had been slow bringing the prisoner in, grabbed Toshiyuki by the neck and marched him off. They came to a great gate, through which countless others dragged like Toshiyuki, or bound or in irons, were pouring from every direction till it was hardly possible even to pass. Inside the gate, the two hundred warriors whom Toshiyuki recognized all too well were glaring at him with fiery eyes and licking their lips in grim anticipation. Toshiyuki was frantically cudgeling his brains for a way out when the fiend who was dragging him whispered in his ear, Make a vow to copy the Sutra of Golden Light. As they went in through the gate, Toshiyuki vowed to copy the Sutra of Golden Light by way of atonement. He was hauled in to stand before the court of Emma, the king of hell. Is this Toshiyuki? A bailiff growled. Another bailiff demanded to know why. Considering the huge number of complaints lodged against him, Toshiyuki had been so slow to appear before them. I brought him straight here, sir, after I seized him, said the arresting officer. What was it you did up there in the world? They asked Toshiyuki. Nothing, really. I just wrote out the Lotus Sutra for people who asked me to. I made two hundred copies. Actually, they told him, your lifespan had a little more to run, but you've been brought in because of complaints that you copied the sutra while you were unclean. Our orders are to deliver you to your accusers so they can dispose of you as they see fit. The two hundred soldiers prepared to take charge of their victim. But I made a vow, Toshiyuki said, shuddering, to dedicate to the Buddha a copy of the sutra of golden light, and I was seized before I could fulfill it. It'll be a terrible sin if I don't go through with it, one I could never atone for. This brought the bailiffs up short. They declared that if this were true, the whole arrest had been a mistake, and they ordered Toshiyuki's claim checked in the great register of deeds. The secretary of the court of hell leaped through the register and read off every last deed of Toshiyuki's. They were all sin. Only at the last split second, when he had gone through the entire list, did he finally announce, Yes, it's true. The entry is here at the very end. Well then, they told Toshiyuki, we'll have to set you free. Go accomplish your vow and continue your life as you think best. The grim host of two hundred, that just now had felt their hands nearly upon him, suddenly vanished, and Toshiyuki returned to life. For two days his wife and children had been mourning him, when all at once he opened his eyes and was back. Joyfully they gave him something hot to drink, and it was only then that he finally understood that he had been dead for two days. In his mind he saw again everything he had just witnessed, as though reflected in the clearest of mirrors. 
and he resolved to copy and dedicate the Sutra of Golden Light, properly purified this time, just as soon as he could himself. In time he recovered fully, and hurried to have a craftsman prepare a scroll of paper to receive the Sutra. But at the same time his thoughts began wandering again, and it was not towards the Buddha and the scripture that they roamed. He was quickly absorbed in romantic visits and fancies, and worried only about how to write the nicest possible verses. So the months and years flew by without his ever copying the sutra until his life reached its allotted term and he passed away again. A few years later the poet Ki no Tomonori had a dream. There came to him one whom he understood to be Toshiyuki, although fearfully changed from what he had once been and he was quite terrifying to look at. A vow I made to write out and dedicate the sutra of golden light gained me a reprieve, his apparition said and I was returned to life. But my heart stayed as frivolous as before, and I finally died without ever copying this sutra. For this I am now suffering the most horrible of tortures. Have pity on me, find the paper I had prepared for the sutra, take it to a certain monk in Midera, and have them make a copy and a dedication. Tomonori awoke soaked in sweat. Dawn had barely broken when he hurried off to his errand. He found the paper and soon was knocking at the monk's door. The monk was glad to see him because, as he explained, he had been on the point of sending a messenger to Monori's house. Tomonori asked why, concealing for the moment his own reason for having come, and the monk related the precise counterpart to Tomonori's dream. Toshiyuki had appeared to him, told him that Tomonori would be able to find the paper, and asked him to copy and dedicate the sutra. The monk's dream, like Tomonori's, had ended with a horrible scream. Tomonori and the monk wept bitterly together over the man's awful fate, and Tomonori produced the paper with an explanation of how he had come to bring it. And so the monk did exactly as Toshiyuki had asked in his dream. When the two dreamed of Toshiyuki again, he seemed in far better spirits. He told them that the merit they had gained for him had greatly lightened his suffering. Well... That was, that was good. I only slight, like scanned through a little bit of the story today. I was like, this sounds interesting. I want to read it, mm-hmm. but I'm not going to check the whole thing. Ooh. So yeah, parts of that for me as well. Obviously, I didn't fully know the story. So it, it was very interesting. And I mean, we've only touched on Buddhist stuff mm-hmm. a few times, but even the Buddhist stuff in there it relates to what we've done before. Like the mm-hmm. Fuji tail in the cave. I remember Emma being in that, the king of hell. But I love the visualization of the Inky River. Mm -hmm. I think that was really cool. It was a really well-written story, or I guess well-written translation. Who who did this one? This translation made by Royal Tyler in the book Japanese. Ooh, done very well. Yeah, it was it was very well translated, Mm -hmm. and it flowed really nicely. And yeah, there was a lot of connections to again to stuff we've talked about before, like the sutras, hell. That we touched upon. Oh, you remember Although that. the first time we talked about it, it was a much more visual than this one was. Yeah. But the the idea that each piece of his body that would have been cut up would have had its own consciousness Ooh. and its own feelings that he could be tortured two hundred times at once and feel every piece of pain. That is quite the punishment for writing sutras whilst thinking of women but i still can't believe that he didn't do it even after being brought dead for two days someone in hell gave him a way out by saying make this vow now to save yourself Uh and then he didn't act on it no he 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 couldn't as if he didn't care that it was gonna happen he he couldn't be a holy for just you know i don't know how long it would take to write that sutra Exactly. Even if he reverted back afterwards, he just had to be pure for the time it took to write the sutra. (laughs) And he experienced it. He saw all those eyes staring at him, licking their lips. And he's like, you know what? She's she's pretty. I like her. But as well, like he had a wife and children. Oh my gosh. They were they were waiting for they were there mourning his body when he came back. And still he drifted into sin. I'm wondering about their reaction, like, Oh, you've been dead for two days. Here, have a warm beverage. That seems kind of 
Oh, yeah, there wasn't no, like, shock or amazement, just like, here, have a tea. Didn't the body start decomposing a little bit, too? Yeah, but when the gods of hell are involved, I guess they can do whatever they like. Yeah. But no, I like this tale, like, randomly stumbling across it today in this book. It was definitely interesting. And Midera popped in again. I didn't I didn't notice that when I scanned through. I'm gonna say something, Thomas. I'm gonna say, you know what the name ring, ring a bell? Sorry. I'm so, uh, sorry. I'm so sorry. Uh, it's such a bad joke. I know. But me da- me- bumping into Midera again, bumping into Emma again. Something else I, 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 I heard that we, like, we'd like we encountered before, but now it's it's escaped my yeah, mind. Yeah, there was something else, mm. but it also... We should look at the different sutras, too. We still need to look into that. I wonder what the sutra of golden light is and what it's for. True. Yeah, we've never really delved into Buddhism mm-hmm. at all. Mm-mm. Our religion in general. I mean, Shinto we kind of have, but more the mythology, the knights teach. Mm-hmm. Oh, it also mentioned the Dragon King. But we've had, they, they, that seems to be an overall term for various dragons. They always seem to be a king of something. So we've had the one of the ocean. We had Lake Biwa. And this is the Dragon King who guards the Buddha's teachings. So that's three different Dragon Kings now. Probably a handful of dragons around this yeah. time period. Which we should touch. We should do dragons as well. We've done some things on dragons, haven't we? A little bit. We've only done dragon imagery when we mm. did tattoos. Oh, that's right. Yeah, like the symbolism and if they're holding certain things, mm. what it means. But we've never really looked at. Because I think for us, like, more or less, if it's a dragon, it probably has its own story. Mm. So it gets its own episode. Who knows? Maybe there's a bit more out there about dragons. Especially that maybe how dragons are portrayed in different um, shrines and temples. Oh, yeah. Different decorations as well. More topics. We really should be writing these down. <laughs> we should, but we always forget to. But then we remember eventually and we still do them. Still, Sorry to be stealing Heather's Corner today. But I do have a poem for this guy. His poem is the number 18 in the Ogura Hyakunin Ishu. If you're ready, I will read the Japanese and see what you can figure out today. Alrighty. Sumi noe no kishi ni yoru nami yoru sae ya yume no kayoichi hitome yokuran. There are some words I recognize, but the definition's escaping me. The one thing I, that did jump out at me was like evening waves. Um, yoru nami is that like evening waves? No, no, no. I, w- I would say that, yeah, like evening waves or nighttime waves. The English translation doesn't specifically say that, mm. but the overall theme definitely relates to that. What is Kishi? That one's driving me crazy because I've, I've heard that before. And I can't recall. And I'm also the kind of person who likes to see things written down. This, this is, uh, I think I'm going to just go ahead and bow out because I just wanted to see the translation. <laughs> And what translation? So the translation they did in the book for this one is Unlike the waves that approach the shores of Sumiyoshi Bay, why do you avoid the eyes of others, refusing to approach me even on the path of dreams? That's an an interesting poem translation in context of the story you just read where he encountered all of those eyes. Oh, it kind of is, right? Mm. Except he was the one doing the avoiding in the But he yeah. But eventually appeared in a dream. It feels like, again, it's a poem. He's writing about someone Mm -hmm. else who's taken his eye and that he seems interested in. He's like, oh, this person's not looking at me the way I'm looking at them. Like, woe is me. So, you you know, you you have a a, a wife back back home, right? So, just saying. A wife and a child who were waiting over his dead body for two days. Yeah. Well, let me see what the analysis for this is. Hmm. So the word yoru in this, so the word yoru in Japanese puns on to approach a knight indicates that the lovers could only meet by night. Mm, Makes sense. So the path of dreams uh, was the path that lovers would travel by night in their dreams to visit their beloved. However, in this particular poem, it appears that the lover's fear of being seen is so great that Toshiyuki does not dare to visit his beloved in the waking world or even in the world of dreams. And this particular imagery, the Path of Dreams, was often used in Heian period poetry, and its first appearance was in a poem by Ono no Komachi. We should revisit her too. Her own episode. Mm -hmm. Found a random little tale today, and he just also happened to 
have a poem from a book we've referenced a lot lately. This is true. I hope you enjoyed it.、Mm-hmm. I did. Definitely a different tale, and the poem felt is a quite a different poem to what <laughs> we've usually had. That is everything for me for today.、Uh, but thank you everyone for tuning in today. Until next time, that's everything for me. How about you, Heather? That's all for now. All right, everyone. Speak to you next time. Matane. Matane.